Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> Tim, I'd like to, to start with you. I, I was at APEC, I'm sure many of you were there too, and we heard President Trump's speech, very quite aggressive speech, clearly going to pursue the America First policy. He said, and I quote, we are not going to let the US be taken advantage of anymore. Are we looking at a, is there a potential for a trade war with China? I certainly hope not. I can't totally exclude the possibility. I think the problem is uh, there's a consensus in the United States, and this would have been true uh, no matter who had won the presidential election. I, there's a consensus in the United States that the current arrangement is not working the way it should. Uh, the real debate is whether uh, the WTO tools are adequate for addressing the problem or not. Um, that what is the problem? The problem perceived in the United States is that China has uh, changed its course somewhat from what was originally anticipated when they joined the WTO. Their economic development model now is so focused on industrial policies across such a wide range of industries using some very powerful industrial policy tools and the result is that uh, we don't see competition and we don't see openness in the way that we had originally anticipated. So uh, again, no matter who had won the presidential election, I think you would have seen some real changes in US policy and the, the, the real debate now in the United States is can we address these problems within the framework of the WTO or will it be too much of a strain on the WTO? In the WTO, if you see a country that is subsidizing its industries or precluding market access in certain ways, you can bring WTO disputes. Or you can also uh, have trade remedy cases, you know, anti-dumping, uh, uh, countervailing duty cases. But if you try to do that with China with sort of the opacity about the way some of these policies are carried out, and when they're carried out across so many industries, uh, you end up having legions of lawyers trying to negotiate uh, trade deals uh, it's kind of like the way the U.S. and EU deal with aviation, you know, fights between Airbus and Boeing. But if you took that and put that across the entire economy, you don't really have a workable system. So what I expect, and uh, Ambassador Lighthizer said in Da Nang, uh, that the U.S. is willing to use its own economic leverage to pursue some of the issues that it has. And that, to me, is code for we're not necessarily going to focus on whether what we do is WTO consistent or not. So that's the concern. Um, on the one hand, I do think that the US is justified in raising some very uh, legitimate concerns. On the other hand, China is finding that its economic development model seems to be working pretty well for it. So you have an irresistible force and an unmovable object, and that's why I hope that we'll find a resolution that doesn't result in a trade war. I want to come back a bit later to what the next regulatory changes might be in, in the US. But Jonathan Choi, I'd like to turn to yep. you now. Um, President Xi's speech, in stark contrast to that of President mm -hmm. Trump, spoke about globalization, uh, free trade, liberalization. What's the next move for China? Because some of the mood music coming out of the US is, is of some concern, I'd imagine. I just feel I was also in Dainan yeah. in the APEC meeting because I'm also a APEC member representing uh, Hong Kong, China. And actually, there are two speeches uh, that most of the members would like to uh, hear. Is the first is uh, Mr. Trump's, mm -hmm. but it's Mr. Xi. And for Mr. Trump, it's very clear that he said America first. Mm -hmm. And also, he mentioned that not only America first, it's all Japan, you're Japan first, Korea first. You can protect your interests. Therefore, we have a discussion uh, on the floor that um, if everybody having a, a priority in their own country, how can we compromise? It's not easy. But in President Xi's speech, it's different. It's calling globalization, free trade, liberalization, all these things. And it's a win-win situation. Mm. Yet we feel that the position of China and uh, uh, US has changed a lot. And for China today, I think they, uh, I don't feel that there will be a trade war. I just feel they're compromised. You see that after uh, President uh, Trump uh, went to Beijing, you see immediately he signed a big deal with US, 100 billions of dollars. Uh, of product we purchase from US into China because there's a trade deficit, we understand that. Secondly, you know that uh, just uh, was announced two days ago from the Ministry of Finance from uh, China that uh, the import duty of uh, uh, products from overseas will be reduced from 17.7% to about, on average, 7%. It's a big reduction. 
Therefore, I just uh, uh, feel that China is compromising. Uh, they welcome, uh, because there's a big market in China for trade, they welcome products from all over the world to come into China. And I just feel that uh, one of the movements of this is uh, China, just like years ago, they entered the WTO. They want to be, uh, 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 work together with the, uh, the world in, in general. Therefore, uh, they want the uh, local companies in the China to be more competitive. If they reduce the uh, uh, import duty, how can it survive? The uh, companies in China have to be competitive. I think that's good for China. That's good for the people of China. Therefore, I just feel in the long run, uh, China will be more integrated in the international world. And uh, they want to be competitive. They want to have free trade and globalization. That's what I feel in the future. So you think that these policy shifts will continue and China will compromise and avoid a, a trade war and, 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 and play a... I guess, to more international standards or more Western standards in terms of some of the trade issues that are facing. I just feel that because you see that after we have seen that one President Xi has been speaking in the, I like the BRICS in the Fuzhou and also in the G20 in Hangzhou and in the Bay and Road Summit at May 14th this year, I just feel that the value and the idea they are talking about is similar to the West has been talking in years. <laughs> we just feel it's very interesting. It's the Chinese president talking about peaceful development and uh, uh, coexistence and co prosperity, all these things. I think it's the new idea of China. I think uh, China have uh, confidence now that they can fully integrate in the present world. One of the other big disruptive events <coughs> of the last 12 months or so has been Britain's decision to leave the EU. And there's much talk in Britain and in Europe about turning to Asia. And Ruth, let me, let me turn to you now. Is there real momentum for the EU uh, to, to develop greater, more active trading relationships in Asia? Or is it just too busy with the whole UK issue? Um, when I arrived here reading the newspapers and, and, and preparatory documents, I was struck, of course, in Hong Kong how strong the focus is on, on the Brexit um, um, issue. I think um, uh, it is a complex situation. It is a very complex negotiation, but the end stage is in sight. And, and while there might still be a lot of one-off uh, um, issues that could derail um, a smooth uh, negotiating path, um, Europe will have the ability in prevailing mood of uh, economic nationalism, of pr the protectionist forces, to push for more free trade agreements, be they multilateral, be they uh, bilateral, certainly with the um, ASEAN and the, um, and the uh, Asian Pacific uh, region, because speaking of my country, uh, we depend on favorable trade conditions, um, we depend on strong um, export, and we continue to be strongly in favor of um, free trade. Let me just, uh, Michael, say two things about, or three points, why we actually are in the situation that we are in. Globalization uh, is not just um, you know, a, um, a term for by, by the chattering classes, but it, it was actually uh, came about by two historic one-off um, uh, events. The, the first one, and the, the previous speaker alluded to this, is the entry of China into the global market. Mm -hmm. And I liked what uh, the gentleman said, that China is now comfortable to be in, in the global market. I consider that an achievement. Mm -hmm. The second uh, one-off um, event is and has been the demise of the Soviet Union. So the, uh, the creation of a number of uh, newly independent diverging but, but fairly productive economies to the east, to the former east of the European Union. They all needed to be integrated in global markets, in the European market, and that has contributed to uh, stronger and changed uh, global trade routes and supply chains. So, in, answer, in, in essence, and to your question, no. I think the European Union will have the capacity, the energy, and the focus to integrate more 
the, uh, into the global economy and to be a very strong partner for Asia, Asia Pacific and ASEAN. Paddy Ashdown, the um, situation in the UK, uh, much talk about new trade deals in the post-Brexit world. Does the UK have the capacity, the bandwidth, the skill uh, to negotiate deals with Asia and how successful is it likely to be? Well, Michael, I think the, the short answer to that question is it has the capacity, it has the will if it leaves the European Union, which I still hope it won't. Um, but it has to accept that in all circumstances that I can see, its negotiating hand is going to be weaker outside the European Union than it would have been within it. Um, uh, let me just step back, if I may, without wishing to take up too much time. I mean, one of the things I do is write books, and I'm yes. writing a book at present. Um, which requires me to be deep in uh, research into the 1930s, and I'm bound to say that the similarities between the age in which we live and the 1930s scares me to death. Uh, we don't have a madman intent on conflict, and we have stronger democracies than the Weimar Republic, which could be overturned. But nevertheless, the mood of our times undoubtedly, ladies and gentlemen, is towards protectionism and isolationism, fed in large measure, in my view, by a cry of rage from those who have been left out, particularly in the advanced Western democracies, of, from the fruits of globalization. Mm. And this is a revolt against globalization, and that's what's on, behind this. And I think if we are looking at uh, trying to reassert the effectiveness of our governmental and democratic systems, then we have to recognize that and begin to tackle it. How do we better distribute the benefits of globalization. Anybody who knows anything about anything knows that that's a good thing for everybody, and if we reverse that trend, we will all suffer. A few words on Britain. I mean, I start from the proposition, Michael, which will not be surprising to you, uh, that this is a miserable, terrible, ridiculous, stupid decision that my country took. <laughs> Could you be a bit uh, more direct here, Patty? Yeah, I, I, I didn't I, quite I, understand uh, what If, if saying, you want me yeah. to be, I will. It denies all the things that I think Britain is famous for, and it gives Britain strength. And, uh, and it makes me feel extremely sad. I, I was, on the day it happened, I was deeply... I, actually, I saw it coming, as you know, and made a prediction about it. So I'm going to make another prediction. And uh, like that one, um, this one isn't going to be uh, um, popular at the time either. Um, nevertheless, at the start of the summer holidays, I took the view that on balance we were going to have to grit our teeth and go through with Brexit. Brexit. <coughs> I now take the view that, on balance, I think we probably won't go through with Brexit. On balance, not by much, 52, 48 perhaps, but the other way around. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is largely not because we couldn't if we wanted to, but because of the gross, total, utter, dysfunctional, dystopian nature of our government. Um, <laughs> Shall I, shall I put that more dip diplomatically? Please do, please do. Yes, I, yes, I, yes. I'm sorry, you must discount for the fact that you're listening to an opposition politician and one who's very angry about the decision that we've been led into, <laughs> largely in the interests of the Conservative Party. But the reality, nevertheless, is this, that first of all, they are, the cabinet is divided. Even if you had a trade deal, it doesn't know what kind of trade deal it wants to get because it disagrees. Is it going to be this kind of soft one or is it going to be that kind of soft one? The Prime Minister, it seems to me, is largely at present without any kind of authority. I don't think this government is frankly capable of delivering anything. If you ask them to deliver the Sunday newspapers, they probably couldn't. Um, and the second thing is that we are now so far behind the curve um, as you will know, when I'm so far behind the curve because we've wasted so much time that actually it will be impossible to deliver a good trade deal. So one way or the other, I think that the clock is going to be stopped. In the classic case of the European Union, it has a wonderful diplomatic technique. It simply pretends that tomorrow is actually today. Uh, the clock is stopped and we just go on. Or there'll be a transitional deal. The idea that we will get a trade deal in the limited time left over to, I think, is for the birds. Now, there are three things that are standing in the way. Anne said she thought they'd get there. Viewed from the European Union, I can understand why you do it. There's three things standing in Britain's way. One is the money. I think in the end, the money, we will reach a deal on the money. The second is the conditions for European citizens living in Britain. I think that can be done as well. The third is, in my view, almost impossible to solve, which is how do we solve the problem of uh, the border in Northern Ireland? Um, and the Irish government is now playing very hard ball on that, and I can understand why. Uh, the British government cannot achieve the only solution that will solve that problem, which is we call Ireland one trading bloc, we draw the economic border down the Irish Sea, because they are dependent on the Ulster Unionists, God help them. 
um, for their um, support in Parliament. And so I don't see how we arrive at a solution on that. Um, and we'll have to, I mean, I just, I just cannot see what that solution is. Mind you, I'm not sure everybody spotted this, so it may be helpful if I just outline this. Although the Irish government is playing a very hard line on this, and I understand why and sympathise with that, they simply say, if there is going to be a hard border in Northern Ireland, we will not sign off, you cannot proceed with trade talks, let alone an outcome deal. What that could lead to is a, is a, uh, a no deal, um, that we will go over the edge of the cliff uh, and go to WTO. In those circumstances, it's probable that the European Union would have to impose a border in Ireland because it couldn't have um, no border between one area that was in the WTO and not. And in the end, although the Irish government's playing very hard ball, they must know that if they push this too far and it goes to a no deal, they actually suffer from in consequence. So there's a lot of balancing going on here. Um, I think the last problem, and I finish here, is the House of Commons. The House of Commons is pretty well deadlocked now, if you take the disagree, the rebels in each of the parties. I'd think that the House of Commons would not vote for no deal, uh, would not vote for a WTO solution. Uh, I think the House of Commons would not vote for a hard deal. I think the House of Commons could be bored to vote for a decent trade deal, but since the government is divided, it doesn't know how to deliver or negotiate a decent trade deal. So in the end, I think, I think that um, in the end, I think that this thing ends in some possibly ends in some kind of stalemate. Here's my prediction since I made the last one. By the way, I do have to remind those who are not, do not watch the BBC, that as I make this prediction, please remember that I am the man who sat in front of the television sets at the uh, 2016 election and announced that if the results were indeed what they said, uh, what, what the exit polls indicated, I would eat my hat since which I've had to eat five. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> one made of chocolate, one made of marzipan, one made of shortbread, and two absolute real hats, but very small ones. <laughs> I actually think the government is now so dysfunctional it cannot last. And I think that at some stage during the next year, the British government will collapse in on its own dysfunctionality. I, I don't know the date, I don't know the time. I just think there is a moment when people will say this can't continue because they're so bad. Second thing is that my view is that if that were to happen, um, then either a second referendum, and I think that's on margin less likely, but more likely a general election of which Brexit is the key element. In other words, it has the same function. Sure as a referendum um, is likely to occur. And in those circumstances, given the pain the country is now suffering as a result of this stupid decision, I wouldn't be surprised to see it, the, the, the country take a different view than the one they took last time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back to, to, to those issues, much covered there. So now, Parisma, ASEAN meetings must, seem like a, must have seemed like a dream compared with what's going on in the U <laughs> UK and EU at the moment, if you listen to, to, to Paddy Ash It's uh, equally entertaining, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but is there an opportunity for ASEAN now? I go back to a few years ago, I think when you were in the UK, and the EU, I asked an EU official, what's the chances of a, an ASEAN-EU trade pact? Not really likely. Now, actively talking about it. So is this an opportunity for ASEAN to, to step up, for want yeah. of a better phrase, take advantage of the turmoil? Well, uh, I think uh, there are opportunities for ASEAN, but um, ASEAN must uh, uh, get its act uh, together. Uh, first, uh, it must not uh, forget what uh, brought ASEAN to where it is now. No? Uh, 50 years ago, uh, those of us who are old enough uh, would know that uh, the ASEAN countries were uh, like dominoes, no? they were expected to f fall. No? Uh, we were in the midst of the Indochina uh, uh, war. Uh, and, uh, you know, fast forward now, uh, with the end of the Indochina war, with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, we basically had stability. No? Uh, we also were blessed with domestic political stability. So the first condition uh, that's necessary to continue uh, ASEAN on the current path is uh, stability. Mm -hmm. no, stability in the South China Sea, uh, domestic political uh, stability, and uh, to the realization that um, individually, except Indonesia, all the ASEAN countries are small, and therefore they must band uh, together and therefore keep the centrality of uh, ASEAN. 
And um, given the giants around us and the various political uh, uh, international interests, uh, we, you know, we're being pulled left and right. And sometimes centrality of ASEAN uh, is uh, uh, lost. No? But we must not uh, uh, forget that. And the third thing is uh, the fact that uh, ASEAN is probably the biggest beneficiary to globalization. Mm. More than any region, uh, ASEAN's trade is covered by free trade agreements. I think over 60% of our trade is uh, covered by free trade agreement. And therefore, uh, to really take advantage of the current situation, uh, we must uh, act together and use ourselves as a catalyst uh, to make sure that the push towards uh, uh, globalization continues. No? And that's why in the Manila uh, ASEAN uh, uh, chairing, uh, the push for what he referred to as MISMI, the MSMEs. No? Uh, into, uh, globalization has happened at the top. No? And uh, the bulk of the smaller entities have actually lost out. And that's why we've seen the rise of populism, because there's a lot of people that uh, have been left out. No? We need to bring them back. And we need to make sure that uh, you know, globalization business uh, is, the, I think, the biggest public-private partnership. Yeah. No? Uh, governments actually you know, negotiate, but it is business that makes business happen. No? And therefore, we need enlightened business to actually uh, come in. Uh, obviously, it's nice to optimize uh, profits, no? but they have to start talking about win-win uh, strategies, complementation as a strategy. Uh, ASEAN got, got its confidence because there were enlightened companies that started and proved the fact that integration can be win-win. A good example is an EU company, Nestle. Early on, they approached different uh, countries and said, We'd like to increase the scale of our factories around the region by concentrating production of certain products in certain countries, but not putting everything in one country. By doing so, it gave uh, all the countries uh, the confidence that we can actually integrate and win together. And that is why I think it's important that uh, we, the uh, private sector and government really, uh, band together to make sure that we're able to take advantage of this. Um, there are two other trends that I think uh, we must not lose sight of because uh, uh, there was been, uh, there, there's been a study that says that a lot of the losses of jobs is not really true due to globalization. It's actually due to technology. You know? And with the uh, increase in the pace of technological innovation, especially with AI and all of these uh, developments, there will be more job losses. Uh, in, in the future. And if we you know, uh, engage in this intramural about global trade and uh, just focus on that and lose sight of the fact that technology is going on its own, no? uh, and ultimately we might be uh, uh, caught in a surprise that we're actually trying to solve the wrong uh, problem. And then in our part of the world, there's a third uh, aspect, which is climate change. Uh, you know, the Philippines, third most vulnerable, a big part of Asia is subject to uh, climate change, that can be the other uh, uh, factor that can really change the whole equation. So in summary, my, my point is ASEAN you know, needs to band together, needs to keep ASEAN to, uh, centrality, needs to push for uh, uh, continued the globalization, and need to keep its, keep its eye on developments in the technology as an opportunity to leapfrog and not be uh, caught by surprise, and at the same time look at green uh, opportunities as another engine for uh, growth. And if we do so, then I think uh, we will be able to uh, uh, continue the success we've had. Okay. Let me turn back to the US now. And, and I mentioned earlier, there's talk of regulatory shifts, more closer look at, at Chinese investments. What is the next step? Let's be practical here. What's the next law going to be passed? What regulation will come into the US to, to, to deliver the America first? Policy? Well. First of all, I think we have to, we have to ask, what, what do we mean by America first? And I don't think that America first means America only. And I think that if you, if you step back and say, okay, what is in the interest of any particular country, it's to trade with other countries. And you can't trade on unilateral terms. And so what we're seeing right now is a lot of reassessment going on, whether it's in the UK, Europe, uh, in, in ASEAN, about you know, what, are, what are the terms that work for countries best? And, uh, you know, if you look at the last 10 years, if you take the top 25 economies in the world, in those 25 economies, 
550 million people have seen their incomes either stagnate or decline. And so there's, there's this feeling that whatever is happening right now is not working very well. And that's why you see Brexit. That's why you see things going on in the United States the way they are. So you do have to address the underlying problem. Um, so we hear different models. We hear what uh, Xi Jinping is saying, as, as Jonathan pointed out. But these different models will work differently for different countries. Let me read a short statement. This is what President Xi said at the signing ceremony with President Trump when all those deals were signed. He said, China is willing to expand its imports of LNG, crude oil, and petroleum products and other energy products from the United States. We will also explore the potential of US exports of beef, cotton, and other agricultural products to China. We will also deepen cooperation on service trade, including in areas of tourism, movies, and education, while we also hope the US will further ease its export control on civilian technologies and products to China. So what is he saying? He's saying, we want your raw materials, your energy, your agricultural products, some of your services, and the technology that you haven't let, allowed us to access. Mm -hmm. There's not much mention of, of manufacturing goods in there at all, high-tech manufacturing. To the extent that that's what you want to trade with China, they really want to take that space for themselves. And so that's why, if you look at the American companies doing business in China, in our AmCham China survey last year, 81% of the companies say they feel less welcome because of Chinese policies that are trying to carve out competitive space for those industries themselves. So the US is trying to look at the Chinese policies that are, that are I, I was on a panel last week with the uh, ambassador of Chile to China, and they sell agricultural products, raw materials, and some services to China, so they don't have any trade disputes at all. So the US is looking at China's policies and saying, okay, we don't think we should be excluded from the industrial sector, and we're concerned about what they're doing and how it's affecting these industries around the world. And so I think the next thing you're gonna see is that China, the United States is gonna have a closer scrutiny on Chinese investment in the US to see whether it's state-supported, to see whether it's trying to pursue an industrial policy that would develop a particular Chinese industry on terms that are not necessarily competitive in the sense that the WTO anticipates. Jonathan Troy, that sounds mm. like it will escalate tensions rather than, the, yeah. the, than ease them. Is there a view in China that China should start setting the rules as opposed to follow the lead of, of, sort of Western trading norms? I just feel that what you mentioned here is very interesting. Asia trade in the new global order yeah. because the world has changed. And uh, we can expect China to um, uh, move uh, as quick as, uh, as the uh, uh, Western world would like them to do because you know it's still a socialist country and actually we should uh, feel that China today uh, is the one big step forward already mm -hmm. because what he has been talking about uh, globalization, liberalization, free trade and all this. And uh, I just feel that uh, besides bilateral, we have to think of bilateral mm -hmm. because uh, we are talking about FTA in the whole region. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, uh, this gentleman mentioned the ASEAN FDA, and ASEAN, we are very happy to Hong Kong. Uh, we just uh, participated. Uh, we thank you for the friends from Vietnam, Philippines, yes. Indonesia. <laughs> they all supported us uh, to have the FDA uh, in ASEAN. <laughs> we also would like to be in RCEP, not only yes. in the ASEAN, RCEP. And actually, for example, at the, uh, when we are uh, negotiating in ABAC in, the, in Dainang, uh, we always look for TPP. But U.S. feel that it's uh, maybe not for the benefit of it's too early. I don't, uh, I don't understand why, but uh, they just uh, don't want to participate. Therefore, uh, for Japan, for Vietnam, they think of a new term. I just learned a new term called the um, CPTPP. Ah, CPTPP is a new term. Yes, it C rolled C off the tongue, didn't it? Yes. I looked at that. They rebranded it in a more complex TPP. Uh, that's a new term. Yeah. Therefore, everybody is looking for a uh, free trade agreement in the whole region, be it bilateral not bilateral. Because bilateral means uh, only between two countries. It's not only trade, economics, but it's more political, many things get involved. We want to have a free trade agreement. Therefore, we are looking for RCEP. Uh, actually, uh, for APEC, we look for FTAAP. Uh, that is uh, FTA for the Asia Pacific. Yes. 
that, that is what we are looking for. Therefore, uh, for you as mentioned about uh, China and US, I think it's uh, for the G2, the two big guys that, that, that are playing the games. What we are looking for is the free trade for the whole world. That's the concept That's behind. Right. Therefore, we hope that uh, 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 we have to understand China, it is a socialist country, has moved a very quick already. Mm. Uh, to our surprise, sometimes well, what President Xi is talking about, we felt, oh, <coughs> we, 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 we couldn't imagine that he, he mentioned all these terms in the past few years. Yes. It's a socialist country, you know, but he's talking about free trade, globalization, cost priority, uh, all these things. We just feel that uh, China has done quite a lot already. Let's so move back to Europe now, and, and, and Anne Ruth, you were nodding furiously uh, at certain points during, well, during well, Patty's, uh, yeah. Patty's moderate and measured uh, uh, predictions <coughs> for the UK and Europe. Well, if I, I, I would, I, if I were a UK citizen, uh, um, I would be as passionate and furious as Patty Ashton was about leaving uh, um, uh, the, the European Union. But, but here's a here. I'd like to offer a perspective. Um, I think at least we now know what the uh, negotiating uh, themes are that uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom jointly will have to uh, uh, address and will have to find solutions for. So we are in a much better space now than we were about a year ago. And let me also remind you that Europe, the European Union, has stomached even more complex issues in its past, such as uh, taking in a number of Eastern European countries into the European Union architecture, um, um, expanding uh, the internal market, the single market towards Eastern Europe, including the uh, strategically very important um, uh, Balkans and the Baltic uh, states, coming to a degree of an accommodation with, the, with Russia, uh, in, in the wake of that, although that now is, is, a, is a less um, happy chapter currently. The European Union as a whole ha is, a, is, a, is, is a, uh, a region with very strong institutions, a strong legal tradition. Uh, in certain parts, certainly in my country, which is Germany, a vision for the continent. And so I, f I feel that um, if the British government can preserve a degree of stability and we don't see a, you know, a, a disintegration and, and not too many uh, things coming from left field that we should see the UK sail alongside Europe in the next 50 years. Um, my concern and my worry is that currently believing that the UK will have, and I agree with Patty, will have advantageous and solid and stable trade deals with the rest of the world. I cannot see how that will work. And I'm also concerned that the uh, extremely well-educated, um, open-minded, globalized uh, British elite will be um, absorbed for the next 10, 15 years to come with managing just one issue, which is Brexit, rather yeah. than projecting, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the values that the, the, the values of the Anglo-Saxon world uh, beyond its borders. And I know that, for instance, that is so precious to Asia. On our uh, topic, global trade. I'd like to um, uh, look at it, um, perhaps with a question mark, in the following way. <coughs> we had <coughs> hoped, as Europeans and in the Western world, that TTIP, um, which is now you know, frozen, mm. uh, would propel us into an, uh, an area where the Western world, jointly then with ASEAN chipping in, to set standards, to come to regulatory uh, complementarity. Um, I, don't, I don't see how that can now happen. I have a question mark about regulatory expansion of China. Uh, what is the comparative advantage of ASEAN in that new in environment? I think that is a strategic uh, consideration we should undertake. Hmm. 
Okay, we'll get back to, to that ASEAN question in just a moment. But Patty Ashdown, stability. Can I ask Anna a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I don't disagree with her analysis, by the way. Um, although I don't think it will necessarily end up in quite the happy circumstance she describes. <laughs> I do, however, think that she's dead right in saying that if we pursue this course, you will find the entire British energy for the next decade um, sorting out the aftermath of Brexit. And we'll have energy and room for very little else. I think in terms of the trade deal, it's my view, I just wonder whether it's Anne's, that actually the British um, government is not going to be able to negotiate with the European Union a bespoke trade deal. We're going to be offered a series of models. Is it Canada? Is it Switzerland? Is it Norway? That, it appears to me, is the way that it's currently going. Now, it might be Norway with a little tweak here or there, but it will look like a trade deal of the sort that is already in existence rather than something made uniquely for the British. Is that, is that your view as well, Anne? Um, it, it could turn out that way. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think we currently focus on it has to be the Swiss model, the Norwegian model. No, no, no. We, you're, any, we're offered a range. Or, or and you can choose one of these. A, an a la carte, if you like. <laughs> well, well, let's wait. That's the noise coming out of it. Brussels <clears throat> at present. By the way, I, I don't agree with Anne that um, the European Union has dealt with things more complex than this. I was personally involved very much in the Balkans and Bosnia. Um, and I can tell you it was nothing like politically more dangerous, politically more difficult, but nothing like as complex as we're now con and confronting. I, I, it's a really fascinating discussion, Michael, and I'd like to come back and pick up something slightly broader than we've been talking about. The first thing it was, I, I, Cesar, I think, has really hit an important point, guys. You think you're here negotiating trade deals within the framework of the world, multilateral open trading, reduction of tariff barriers and so on. You must look further than that. And Cesar is right, because if it is the case, you cannot carry the people of the countries which are, who are the trading nations with you, you're going to find a rise in populism and a rise in, in protectionism. And although you will not think of that within your scope, um, how we share the benefits of globalization is crucial. And by the way, and Cesar touched on it again, and I agree with him completely, if you think this is a difficult problem now, it's going to get immensely more difficult once the era, the revolution of robotics comes in because you're going to find more and more of a means of production in fewer and fewer hands. And unless you have a mechanism for sharing that wealth, you could well find instability beginning domestically and that will have an effect on the global trading structure as well. I want to introduce, if I may, a slightly sharp point which will not, I think, be welcome to many of my Western friends. Um, I actually think what we're dealing with here is a, and Jonathan Choi touched on, I think you used the phrase, Jonathan, to reshape the world systems. I think that was, I noted it down when you used it. I think you're beginning to see the end. What we're seeing is the beginning of the end of 400 years of the domination of the West on global institutions. And I use 400 years because it's the end of the, of, the, um, of the Ottoman Empire, which I think was where that begins. We have dominated all of these institutions and now that is a shared space. And I think that's the, as it were, mental change that we need to make. And I then think that looking at this and looking at the sort of voluntary withdrawal of the United States from leadership of the multilateral space and voluntary withdrawal, I have to say, of Britain, who's been a very strong player in there, the leadership of the multilateral space, the space upon which we all depend if the world is to be decently managed, and you guys depend on if it's trade as well, is now up for grabs. And it seems to me that Beijing is now saying, we want a part in this. And there's a real opportunity. I mean, I think Mr. Trump has left a space where China can move in and begin to take a, a, a constructive and responsible part in providing. My guess is Beijing wants, <clears throat> looking at them, Beijing wants a basically rule-based world order. Now, it may not necessarily be our rules, our Western rules, but what they want is a rule-based world order. And I think that's what the rest of us should want as well. And I think ASEAN has a really important role to play in that, if we are talking about that. So the real question, it seems to me, if we are to preserve the multilateral space for all the reasons that we need to do, resolution of conflict, dealing with the green, uh, dealing with the environmental challenge, and of course trade, we must now begin to think of what does the, what does the leadership, what is the disposition of powers um, about the leadership of the multilateral space? And I think we have a new, a new constellation of powers mm. now ready to move into that. Uh, thank God the European Union is absolutely committed to that. Thank God it is. That at least gives us a stake in this. Um, but I think we are now looking at what is something which much, looks much more like a shared space 
than it has um, a, Europe, a, a Western-dominated space for the last 400 years or so. Patty, really keen to explore that. By the way, delighted to have your questions and <clears> comments. <throat> uh, please feel free to engage. We, we welcome it. Uh, if you do wish to ask a question, just put your hand in the air. We'll bring around some microphones. Identify yourself and let us know who you want to ask a question of. Please, <clears> be, invo uh, please be involved in the discussion because it's a very important one. But Jonathan Troy, Patty makes a very, very good point. Mm -hmm. Who's going to set the rules? Is this the Beijing aim, to set the rules, to fill the void that seems to be being left by the US? And where <clears> does ASEAN <throat> play in this? Let's start with you. I just feel that um, Beijing doesn't want to really set the rule. But no. um, since uh, this gentleman said very clearly, clearly that in the past 400 years, the Western world set the rules of the game, especially for England, UK, and US. But the situation has been changing, you know? Uh, US feel that it's America first. We don't really care about other things. We care about America's interest. That's one thing. That was give some room for other people to really participate. Therefore, uh, UK also, you see, you want to leave <laughs> EU. Uh, it is another uh, uh, new situation in the Western world. Therefore, Beijing together, you know, China today, you like it or not, is the biggest trading country in the world. They're the number one trading country. Therefore, of course, they get more involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have the way of doing things. Therefore, whether they understand the rules of the game, I don't know. But I just feel that maybe they're in the, in the, in the terms that, that they may really uh, participate in the vacuum because the world is changing. Because mm. Asia trade is in the new global order. What is global order? Global order is changing every day. And today, you like it or not, the economic gravity is moving from the west to the east. The east is China, Japan, Korea, ASEAN. That is Asia. <coughs> and it's now coming up quickly. And, uh, you know, happening in the, the Western world, you know better than I do. I just feel the world is keep on changing. And of course, China today is uh, the, the, the one of uh, the uh, biggest trading uh, country, uh, the second uh, largest economy in the world. And uh, they, of course, they want to put some more. And also, uh, the um, idea is changing, especially under pres President Xi, uh, on the environmental, uh, security, uh, many, many things. Is he want to uh, reach uh, globally, not only in China. That's my comment. So, so uh, are we looking at chain, uh, a rule-based global order, but Asia setting more of those rules? China, possibly ASEAN? Well, uh, ASEAN uh, can actually play the uh, catalyst uh, in this, uh, you know, in, in pushing forward uh, uh, globalization. Because if you look at uh, ASEAN, it's the least threatening of all the regions of uh, uh, Asia. And uh, we've seen uh, that ASEAN has engaged Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand, India, you know, now uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Russia, uh, etc. You know? uh, so ASEAN can play that role, and it's, it's the, to its interest that it does. So obviously, we want the Doha round to be concluded. No? That's the uh, simplest thing uh, uh, for uh, everyone. No? But uh, while we're, you know, my main concern, and while we're so concerned about the uh, domestic uh, political uh, repercussions of uh, trade. There's many things creeping up uh, behind us that we must uh, uh, deal with. Uh, that's international and in, uh, global in character. Uh, that's the coming of uh, uh, more and more technology, yes. which I think will create so much job destruction, which will create so much uh, uh, polarization uh, within and among uh, uh, countries. That is a big concern for ASEAN because uh, uh, you know we need to educate people. We need to have the resources to make sure that we can actually become players in that uh, uh, fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. At the same time, we have a global threat, and that's uh, climate change that we also have to deal with together. So I, I think uh, uh, the, the new global order must uh, start with the premise that uh, we are in this together, we are facing uh, uh, substantial opportunities and threat, and therefore we need to really complement each other, enhance it, each other, and therefore approach this in an enlightened manner. And ASEAN can be a player in that. The US, um, the America First policy, one would have thought that as AI, as technology changes, cost jobs, which inevitably will, would, would will that actually further reinforce the America First policy? and 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 make the US tone even more protectionist? I think we're still looking to see what this American first policy is. And I think that 
we can't equate uh, President Trump's with a fully thought out uh, and implementable set of policy. <laughs> so you have to distinguish between <clears throat> Trump's, uh, Trump's, President Trump's tweets from time to time, <clears throat> and then you have to look and say, okay, what is the United States really doing? And yes, they did pull out of the TPP. I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable for a new government to say, if we're about to enter uh, this hugely important uh, trade agreement, and if you know, we've been concerned about how some of the other trade agreements have worked out, maybe we should take a look at it. Now, President Trump has taken a more extreme position to, than just that. But even, even President Clinton was going, going to do that, right, if she, if she had been elected. So I think we don't know exactly what the American first policy means. My sense from spending a fair amount of time in Washington talking with people in the new administration is that there are a lot of pretty basic questions that they're till, still trying to sort out. Um, in the meantime, I agree with those who have said that the U.S. has not articulated a clear vision for where we should go from here. And I think that that's something that we're missing. But I think that we're going to get more of that in the future because everything that the United States has been in the past has not disappeared in its entirety in a flash. We still have our constitution, we still have our, our institutions, we still have uh, people who have been very thoughtful on these topics. So we have to evolve on this. Having said that, you know, we, we, we have real challenges right now. There do need to be some adjustments and that's what we're all trying to respond to in our different ways. Let me just say that, you know, to the extent that China has been trying to put forward an alternative model, and some of the rhetoric sounds like that sometimes, I don't think it's a model that really is scalable or that can be so useful for other countries. If you can lure investors in your country because you have a market of a billion people, and if there are other countries that are very open to your exports, then you can follow the China model. But I don't think that's something that can be sustained, and I don't think it can apply to every country. So we have to think very carefully about the different approaches that are out there. We have to distinguish between rhetoric and reality, both in the United States and in China. And I think we have to do a lot of introspection right now for the direction we should go. Thank you. Let's bring in the audience now, please. Again, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. We'll bring a microphone around to you who would like to ask the first question. Over there, please, Jeff. Name and organization, if you wouldn't mind, please, sir. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you so much, and congratulations for uh, great uh, uh, presentations. Um, I would like to ask probably to Mr. Purisima or Mr. Choi about uh, all the role that could play other regions like uh, Latin America in this equation of uh, projection of Asia, because it's not isolated. We are sharing Latin America and Asia, the same arena that is the Pacific. I would like to listen a little bit about it. And uh, the second question is about, Mr. Purisima mentioned about the role of uh, the business, uh, business people more than uh, the governments. I would like to see your uh, valoration, listen to your, your point of view about how is developing this uh, collaboration between the business, business world. Thank you very much. Let's start with that second question first, because you mentioned the Nestle experience, and we have a round table later, we were talking about private sector engagement to drive ASEAN integration. What role can business play? And then I'll, I'll come to you, John. So I uh, describe it as enlightened uh, business. So at the top, uh, uh, you know, business make uh, decisions as to where to locate uh, uh, their, their facilities. No? Obviously, uh, to, to uh, attain uh, the utmost uh, efficiency, they'd like to have it in one uh, uh, location. So enlightened business means you don't go for the maximum efficiency, but really a win-win location where you sub-optimize on your decision just to make sure that there are more countries that benefit from your uh, asset allocation decision. At the same time, at the bottom, no, you can look at it as a big brother, small brother concept where instead of going for convenience in your supply chain, you know, going for uh, you know, the, the assured suppliers of goods, you develop supply chains within each of your locations. A good example, uh, uh, those of you who have been to the Philippines, uh, Jollibee, is a very popular fast food chain that uh, is leading in our, uh, in our country. 
before it used to import its onions and uh, tomatoes from as far as uh, uh, the U.S. Because it's so much easier, you know, you just talk to one comp company, you get all the tomatoes and onions, same sizes, uh, at the right time that uh, you want. But they realized that that's not going to help the communities around them. <clears throat> so what they did was they teach the farmers around the uh, Philippines on how to grow the tomatoes and onions that they needed. So it took them um, uh, more effort and more money, but in the long run, they were able to actually source everything within the Philippines. So that's what I call enlightened uh, uh, business. Uh, uh, th there are others do, uh, trying to do that. Unilever doing some coconut. In Vietnam, for example, I think Macro tried to develop the fish uh, uh, supply chain so that it can be uh, a replacement for uh, cod. No? So there are many uh, opportunities. It takes more effort. But in the long run, I think business, if it is to see its uh, uh, you know, uh, operation sustainable, must uh, uh, do it in an enlightened uh, approach. And that way, the backlash against uh, globalization is uh, much less because people see that they are actually uh, winning. And it's happening to a certain extent in, uh, in ASEAN. For example, the Philippines is the back room uh, Singapore uh, is the treasury center uh, where more of the advanced processing is uh, uh, done. Uh, Vietnam and uh, Malaysia is also doing uh, that. So we complement uh, each other, enlightenment and complementation. George, would you agree? I think for the uh, trade between China and uh, Latin America or South America, I think it's uh, a big opportunity. You know China is uh, 1.3 billion people and the consumption, the consuming power is coming up now. You see, for example, we in the past, we don't really import so much meat, but now we import tons of meat from South America. And uh, at the same time, China needs a trading partner in South America because of the population. They are uh, electronic manufacturer, industrial products, consumer products. They don't want to sell to uh, Latin America and South America. I think for the trade between China and these areas, a very uh, big opportunity. But my worry is if the the, the, the trade is too big or the investment is too big, maybe may be sensitive because it's close to America. <laughs> Just a quick thing to that. 400 years ago, the galleon trade between Latin America and China was actually the main uh, trade link uh, of the world, no? uh, going from Acapulco to Manila. No? So I think we're just going back to uh, uh, 400 years ago, but in a different uh, and different context. Uh, context. Michael, can I ask Jonathan a, a question that's been fascinating me? I mean, I don't think China is in a very powerful position, but it's not got everything on its side. It's got some problems as well. I rather doubt whether you can have a liberalized economy and you suppress the liberalization of your society, but we'll wait and see. And I also um, get concerned sometimes, as I'm sure others are, about the indebtedness of Chinese banks a bit. But the, bit, the really big issue, uh, Jonathan, if I may use your first name, is the aging Chinese population. Because this is a really big issue coming down the track, a big problem for China. And there's two ways you can deal with that, and it has a profound effect on trade. Mm -hmm. One is to take the traditional route that's been taken by many Western countries, and that is offshore your production. And then you, know, you help us, you know, and you, 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 you create the wealth from that. And the second is open yourself up to immigration. When that moment comes, which of those two routes do you think China will take? I just feel, first of all, I'm. Uh, Today, my position is uh, I, I China, Hong Kong. Uh. I, I don't really represent China. I, I realize China, China, Hong Kong. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but everybody's presuming I, I, you do. Hong Kong is part of China. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel you shouldn't feel that. Your views, your views, that's all. Probably my views are not a spokesman. And <laughs> aging problem in China, I fully agree with you. But uh, I just feel that China is uh, very advanced, very smart. Uh, first of all, uh, some of their production, they're moving to where? ASEAN country. Yeah. Vietnam, so, yes. uh, Philippines, Indonesia, they are just moving out. That's the reason why they have so-called the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. They have infrastructure, investment, they have all these uh, things are coming out. Secondly, to solve the aging problem, I think they're smart to use technology. AI is what they're using in the future. There's so many robotics factories in uh, research uh, developments in China today. And what they are looking for, I think in the future there's a big opportunity in China, is for the um, so-called the silver economy. Just for the old, old people. Yeah, we, the had healthcare. we had one of those too. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Right. for Japan, all this career, they're coming to China for hospital, clinics, healthcare. All this big opportunity in China. I think China today, we have to understand that. In the past, they were quite, I would say, quite backward. 
but they're learning very fast. But they that, learn the best from the West. Yeah. But that will have a profound impact on trade, won't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. That, that, that route that you're taking already, both the AI and the access. Yes, right. yeah, that's the future. But for the AI, I think technology is strong in the Western world. But China is very strong in R&D also. Yeah. They're just coming up so quickly. You see what's happening in Shenzhen. Hong Kong, we are very. <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have AI, we have aging population, we have climate change, which you've touched on. There are various other factors outside who sets the rules and what regulatory changes there might be that are having a massive impact right. on, on trading architecture. Let's go back to the audience now. Next question, please. Sorry, there. That gentleman. Please. Yes, thank you. Name and organisation, if you wouldn't mind, please. Hello, Alistair Campbell from Bridger Intelligence. Um, I'd um, like to make a comment on the other elephant in the room, which nobody so far has mentioned, and that's India. Would any of the panelists like to comment on uh, the potential effect, the influence of uh, India in the new world order? India. India, yeah. Please. Well, uh, that is why ASEAN actually has engaged uh, uh, India, because the natural counterbalance in the region for China is really... Uh, uh, India and uh, pretty soon this population will actually be uh, uh, more than uh, uh, China. Um, they refer to the aging of China. India's average age is only around 29 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, years old. No, so they will be also a natural supplier of uh, human resources as uh, you know the other parts of the region uh, uh, age. Yeah. ASEAN, no? uh, the vision of ASEAN really is to be the hub of uh, Asia trade where a uh, trade between India and China can go through uh, uh, ASEAN or between Japan and China can go through uh, uh, ASEAN. And I think uh, um, ultimately uh, if we can complement uh, uh, each other, you know, then uh, we can really come and design the new world order that will allow us to uh, face the common challenges together. Uh, <coughs> India also participate in the RCEP. <coughs> if RCEP FTA uh, can be done, it is the biggest FTA in the world. Therefore, we need India to get involved. Of, of course, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, for India and China, it's so-called the, uh, the dragon and the elephant. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, these are two big countries. If they can really collaborate, I think it's good for the whole world. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the good thing is that India has got a very strong tradition of um, international engagement and of multilateralism. It goes right the way back to the Bandung principles, as some of you may remember, if you can think back that far. Um, and I think India, you know, if India and China do get themselves, yep. and if, if you can prevent a confrontation, uh, and you wish to take up the reins of influence and perhaps even leadership in the multilateral space, I think that could make a profound effect. Andrews? I agree completely with Paddy. Yeah. Oh, good. Not many people. <laughs> <laughs> on everything? On everything? No, no. Quite rare, I guess. <laughs> and Tim, mm. India is, we just mentioned the huge population world's biggest democracy, has some, some problems, but a big player in the global trading order. So one of the relatively new rhetorical uh, frameworks that the US has put forward when President Trump was here was talking about the Indo-Pacific yes. region. Yeah. So uh, I can, you know, I'm quite sure that in the US thinking, they're, they're looking very much at the constructive role that India can play in all this. Okay, time for one final question. Who would like to ask the last question? So, oh, so okay, there first, sorry, yes, yes. Yeah. Oliver Kelly from uh, Merlin Entertainments. Um, question for Anne Ruth uh, Herkes. Um, given all the, uh, the rise of nationalism in, in EU countries, um, which country could be next behind uh, Brexit? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or is that now impossible given what's happening with the negotiations? Uh, um, uh, you've, you've realized my penchant for optimism by, by <laughs> now. Um, I, I, I think um, we are about to find um, a, uh, uh, a regime, a stage, a, a, a disposition whereby we will walk the talk towards more stability, prosperity, and the, the rule of law and a resurgence and a, of, of the liberal credo in Europe. Remember, 
Uh, we were extremely worried about elections in France, right. and they have produced a result that is very heartening. We were extremely worried about elections in uh, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. And, and those as well uh, didn't produce the alarmist uh, projections that, that abounded at the time. Um, I think the um, Catalan issue is to a degree under control. I, I say this with all, with all uh, caution, to a degree under control. I, I don't know what Petty will say about all the worries we had about Scotland in the first days of, of, of the Brexit, uh, of, of, of Brexit fallout. So Germany um, will have, a after a period of great flux in the last 10 days or so, will have a, a re renewal of uh, the hitherto government coalition, with, uh, w which will spell um, stability, obviously with uh, a price attached to, to it, uh, but with a leader uh, with known credentials, um, known positions, um, our, our position on economic policy and international matters and dom domestic priorities are well known. So on the whole, I, I think um, let's look towards what really matters in Europe and, 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 and not give in to speculation about um, Europe being on the verge of further integrate, yeah. disintegrating. I, I, I agree with Anne Ruth. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, I, I mean, right. if you'd allow me just out of thought. Look, the, the, um, there was real fear <clears throat> that where Britain led, the rest of Europe would follow. Indeed, Boris Johnson, um, heavens above. Do I have to mention him? Um, he... Um, he actually predicted with great fanfare during the referendum that where we this was a, an age of we were going to set loose a liberation movement across the rest of Europe yes. that yes. we would start and they would follow. They did nothing of the sort. The support for Brexit parties in Europe, having watched Britain do it, has plummeted in every single country. We worried that, um, as Andrew said, that um, Kurt Wilders would come in in Holland. He didn't. He was beaten. We worried that Aunt Marine Le Pen would arrive in France. She didn't. She was roundly beaten with 60% of the vote against her and an avowed liberal European internationalist marched um, resolutely and with considerable majority um, into the presidency. We were worried, and who would not be, that that remarkable leader of yours, Angela Merkel, uh, who recommended to her country that they would take a million refugees, a million yeah. refugees. Yeah. Uh, that would have destroyed any other leader. But she survived, and she survived, it seems to me, extraordinary. She is a, a quite remarkable uh, leader, in my view, in, in, in the, in, um, amongst the Western nations. So I draw the same conclusion as Anne does. It isn't to say that Europe is not without its problems. I mean, you've got extremist right-wing governments in, in Hungary. There's nearly always an extremist right-wing threat in Austria that's not necessarily connected with, with, um, with European things. It goes right the way back into history. Um, but, but in other countries, too, there are problems. But it seems to me that this round of elections, exactly as Anne Ruth has said, that European leaders have decided and their publics have broadly supported them in, in the current condition Europe finds itself uh, to reject Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and isolationism in favor of European <coughs> solidarity. That's where, that's where, and that, it seems to me we've passed that kind of tipping point. And if that's true, then I feel much more comfortable in my bed. Well, as Paddy's going to be comfortable in his bed, we better draw a line yeah. under the, 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 the discussion <laughs> now. I'm afraid we, we are out of time. Uh, clearly, we are in the midst of a dramatic shift in the world trading order. Uh, not only policy decisions that will be made in the US and China will impact that, but as we've touched on AI, climate change and the, and the rise of ASEAN, and of course, how the Brexit situation plays out. Um, Please join me in thanking uh, my guests, Cesar Parissima, Tim Stratford, Jonathan Choi, Andrew Parkas, and Paddy Ashton. <laughs> <laughs>